Hello friends and family and welcome to our boring meditation stuff for October 25th. We were speaking about hallucination yesterday um, in Anil Seth's uh, description of waking reality as a sort of um, composite ongoing <laughs> um, hallucination that uh, in his words, we hallucinate our conscious reality. And um, I wanted to narrow in on the visual uh, within that field. Oliver Sacks, I apologize, these are both TED Talks. I, I assume that these men have given these talks elsewhere, but they're easy to find as TED Talks. Oliver Sacks has a talk where he discusses um, various visual abnormalities where um, concrete hallucinations occur in uh, otherwise healthy uh, elderly adults who are lo losing their vision and parts of their brain are actually activated and produce or interpret data in inaccurate ways because uh, the raw data is no longer coming in from outside. So the um, visual information meant to be processed is gone because of some macular generation or some other blindness and uh, the brain sort of constructs something <laughs> instead um, and I think that that this is uh, it's a useful extreme example of um, this sort of thing that uh, we need not think about the human brain or the human mind as a computer, but that there are inputs coming from outside and that there are processes, there's a pipeline into our consciousness where um, we seem to see and feel and experience these reified, interpreted messages from the outside world. In the inside world, um, this uh, nociception that Anil Seth addresses. And it was actually on my second Vipassana course, after the course, um, where I noticed this in, um, in sharp relief. <laughs> it's not always the case that a person really notices these fluctuations. Uh, so obviously you will notice if uh, you experience some partial blindness and therefore some distinct hallucination, you hallucinate some geometry or you hallucinate a cartoon or a face. That's unmistakable. <laughs> You're not going to um, misinterpret a hallucin well, other than misinterpreting a hallucination as being real, you're not going to misinterpret the fact that you've seen it. But otherwise, our mind does a very good job of piecing together the reality that we're experiencing around us. So I'm looking around this room, I see the walls, I see the cords over where my phone usually charges, I see the books on the shelf, and it all makes sense to me, it all seems cohesive, um, the way time feels like it's passing to me um, is again cohesive and coherent with the rest of everything that I'm experiencing. But after my second Vipassana course, there was a cow that would come into the course center. It was on the last day. And after the ninth day is over, you can lift your gaze. You don't have to stare at your feet anymore. You can talk to other people. Um, on the 10th day and the 11th day when you prepare to go. And so I had my gaze up. I was watching the cow actively. Um, and I was so accustomed to staring at my feet <laughs> um, for nine days that I watched the cow for a while and I had this really distinct, clear impression uh, in that time frame, in the first time frame, of the cow being incredibly beautiful, um, such a beautiful creature and such a healthy creature and such a magical creature and this, um, a very real interpretation, a very uh, 
concrete interpretation of what I was seeing. And then impulsively, I looked down at my feet. And then as I looked up again, um, and this is where these two images come into clear relief is time period one and time period two. In time period two, I look up at the cow and I saw as if the cow was completely different. Um, the cow seemed gaunt. I could see bones, ribs. Um, I could see that the cow was probably malnourished. It was eating some dry grass um, in the Vipassana center where probably it wasn't getting enough food. And uh, I found myself not disgusted, but shocked at how different this cow all of a sudden seemed to me. And my perception of the cow was such that it differed so much from one moment to the next, and in such clear relief from one moment to the next, that um, it really honestly felt as though I'd been teleported or the cow had been teleported. One of us was not the same as it was a moment ago. And of course, that's not true. It was the same cow. And it's just my perception that was changing rapidly and uh, in a an entirely um, observable way, where normally it's not. Normally our, our uh, perception may be changing very quickly over time, but we smooth out the curve and we make sense of the whole imagery because we don't want to uh, we don't want to jar ourselves with too much <laughs> um, fast moving, difficult, complex imagery. Um, and for the most part, the universe is not providing us a lot of fast moving, complex imagery. It's not constantly shifting the bounds of reality on us. It's not as if this stool I'm sitting on is suddenly dissolving and I'm on the floor or it's turning into a whale. Um, there's no strange disjoint measures of our reality. But in the case of the cow, my perception is changing drastically from the first moment to the second moment where it's just how I was probably feeling inside um, again, this internal uh, sense, um, internal sensory perception, nociception that is going on in the body all the time, that probably in one moment it was positive and the next moment it was slightly more negative. And so I perceived the cow as being completely different because it was feeding back into my external perception. And so we have this, we have this perception all the time going on. We have this same process of whatever is happening internally affects our external perception. We see someone else, we see them a certain way, we interpret their behavior a certain way, we interpret their facial expressions a certain way, we interpret um, the color and the light and the sound and the smell, everything around us um, keyed off of how we feel internally. Um, and again, not feeling emotion, not feeling thought or some mystical feeling, literally physical sensation within the body is feeding our mind constantly in terms of how our mind is interpreting the external world. And then how we then interpret the external world feeds back into this same loop. So if I see the cow and the cow seems very gaunt and I think that it's ugly and I start hating that image, then it will feed back in. It was like, oh, okay, some internal feeling of, of hatred or disgust and then I feed that out and it feeds back in and so on and so forth until I move on to the next image. <laughs> then I walk away and experience something else. But um, this is a continual process and uh, it is helpful to pick these um, these extremes where uh, at one extreme we have total blindness or total blindness in part of the eye which causes 
a portion of the brain responsible for processing visual imagery to distort our conscious perception of the external world, we can say, oh, okay, well, surely that, whatever that is, lives along some sort of spectrum where on the other end of the spectrum, there is natural, uh, normal, constant processing of visual imagery where the visual imagery is cohesive and we can make sense of it and it is sufficiently accurate um, as a representation of what is outside of us. We have no perfect representation of the external world, right? We never will. Um, our eyes are quite flawed, <laughs> mine especially. Um, but our, our eyes are kind of feeding some raw light visual images into the brain, um, well, into the, the nervous system first and then through the brain and through all these filters. And we try to make sense of that. You know, we use that information. Um, and that that whole process can go completely out of whack tells us that there are probably stages along the way where um, it's not completely out of whack, but uh, we may be um, mis wildly misinterpreting <laughs> uh, the, the data that our eyes are giving to us. Um, I think that that's uh, useful uh, to know. And so to tie this back again, I think it is difficult to uh, discuss these aspects of meditation in terms of anapana um, exclusively. So here in this context, anapana is not the end goal. Um, if what we're talking about is the use of meditation for penetrating the physical body with our attention, and um, experiencing this proprioception, nociception, interoception, um, these internal senses uh, directly, then we're talking about Vipassana meditation. Um, but uh, Anapana gives us the, it, it walks us through the door. So that is the first and absolutely necessary step. You can't just jump to Vipassana meditation. <laughs> you would find it incredibly frustrating and you wouldn't make it anywhere um, because Anapana is the tool with which Vipassana med meditation is actually executed. Um, you could uh, think of it in, in terms of, of carpentry, perhaps. Um, if you want to chisel or carve a figure, Anapana meditation is sharpening the knife, it's sharpening the chisel. And then once you have the chisel, once you have the knife, you can actually carve the wood. Um, so that is uh, all I have on uh, hallucination, the idea of hallucination within terms of um, visual hallucinations. I'll link again to, uh, to Oliver Sacks um, and his talk. Um, so you know what I'm referring to in retrospect. Um, I hope everyone is taking good care of themselves, and I hope you're all taking good care of each other. I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Goodbye.